Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Christian, and this is the Ice Age Farmer broadcast. And I'm joined today by a very special guest, Allison McDowell. Allison is a mother and a dedicated researcher studying the working parts of the World Economic Forum's Fourth Industrial Revolution, the global takeover of industries and public policies by the central banks, multinational corporations, big tech technocrats, and the billionaire-funded foundations. Allison, in my opinion, is uniquely capable of distilling the agendas at play, the actors involved, and the language that they use into real-world terms that we can all talk about and understand. I'm thrilled to welcome her today so that we can do just that, have a conversation about this total technocratic takeover of everything, not just food, but everything from the big picture, society as a whole, right down to our bodies and the microbiome within them, uh, certainly our children and our futures as well. So that's why this is a super important conversation. Uh, you can find Allison on YouTube, and also she blogs at wrenchinthegears.com. Before we begin, I do have to say, if you appreciate this broadcast, if you value this information, please help me keep the broadcast running. There's a few ways listed to do that at icehfarmer.com slash support, and I very genuinely appreciate your help. Now, without further ado, Allison McDowell, welcome to the Ice Age Farmer broadcast. Ah, thanks for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure. You do fantastic work, and I've been looking forward to our conversation. Um, I really appreciate that we come from very different backgrounds and lines of inquiry, but our work has evolved to fundamentally the same conversation, which is that we are spreading the word about and fighting a holistic, technocratic, anti-human agenda. And um, the bottom line, just to sort of frame our conversation today, is that there is this agenda to take total surveillance and control over every aspect of our life and the world, the food we eat, what's in our bodies, our microbiome, uh, how we raise our children, all of it. Uh, it sounds crazy, but if we start using words like uh, tracking and incentivizing good food for good health outcomes or social oh, impact against, investing, against, right? Against, then, right? I know. then exactly, then it's really hard to, uh, to to understand, I think, for a lot of people. But it's certainly it's harder to argue against that biodigital conversions. So suddenly you're a visionary philanthropist. Uh, so I really appreciate you joining me today to first of all, because I want to get more eyes on your work. Uh, wrenchinthegears.com. She is on Twitter at Philly852 and does somehow, somehow we both still have YouTube channels. Um, <laughs> let's, let's aim to really crush it today and, and <laughs> get me banned finally. Um, and, and yes, to joining me to have this important conversation about that agenda, where we are with it, the fact that, it's, that there's a sense of immediacy, right? There are actually already World Food Programs doing tests of blockchain-based currencies at the refugee camps. Biden and the USDA is seeking to expand SNAP benefits, which of course speaks to the whole thing that's all rolling together right now. We're leaping into this beast system. Um, and so I want people to understand what that means. And so I'm thrilled you're here to help me explain that. Um, you want to start just by sort of introducing yourself and your background and how you started looking at all this? Right. Um, so I'm based in Philadelphia and I, I sort of describe myself as a mom and an independent researcher. So I, I really, and I actually, I work at an, an urban botanic garden that has a, like a, a small agricultural component that is, is framed as really a healing um, program, like an earth-based uh, soil growing program, really. And so I don't do that. That's not my primary fo focus of work, but I have been sort of on, uh, you know, a piece of land in a post-industrial urban landscape for a long time. And so I have both sort of a macro view and a micro view of some of these systems that are underway. And um, I actually just got into this um, with uh, school closures in our city of Philadelphia, where an underfunded urban school district and Boston Consulting Group came in and they closed 23 schools and laid out thousands of teachers. And then like I went from being sort of the, a naive, like liberal, like that's not fair, <laughs> you know, like life had been fair, well, then that's not right. And then realizing as I dug in and followed money and power that uh, it was about much, much more than just public education. It was about controlling, as you said, all these different aspects. And a lot of it was my focus is around the weaponization of the social safety net and the ways in which um, my framing that coincided with my awakening around these systems of power was also understanding like broader histories, um, including um, around, you know, 
empire, right? Like the inland empire of the United States and what mm -hmm. happened to indigenous people. So like some of my framing of what's happening around food systems and control of people, I feel is very strongly connected to um, the dispossession that happened, you know, hundreds of years ago um, when people were taken out of their natural food systems and their relationship to land in a non-globalized, you know, a, a supply chain economy and in that way. So that was sort of my way in. It was about poverty management after the schools and that was about health management. And, you know, fundamentally, if you can control people's access to shelter and their access to food, um, you know, you, you can control huge numbers of, of people. And that's what, sort of where things are now. Absolutely. And I, one of the things I liked, that, that you saw, I saw you on Twitter say, I wish I could have, uh, you know, learned about this and warned people about it without having to learn a completely new language. And that's part of the reason yeah. I, I said up front that when you dress it up with these weird phrases, impact investing and uh, good health outcomes, it's, you know, I don't think people really understand that this is all about control. Can you, how did you start learning that language? And can you speak to that a little bit? Um, well, mostly what, um, I do. So in Philadelphia, we're also the home of the University of Pennsylvania and other higher systems of higher education. And this entire program of looking at um, natural life, really. So human life is a huge piece, but also uh, financializing nature and natural systems came out of Wharton out of the business school at University of Pennsylvania. And the former uh, president of the university, Judith Rodin, left to become the head of the Rockefeller Foundation. So she set up what has essentially become this game um, that runs on big data, big data analytics. And when I was poking around in the education space, I kept bumping up against, like, not just venture capital, you know, there, there were venture ca capital firms and consulting firms that were interested in putting, like, computers in schools and all of these things. But it wasn't just that, like making money off of devices or off of cloud computing. It was actually hedge funds. And I kept thinking, like, what do the hedge funds have to do? Like, why is it? It's not just, you know, as, as predatory maybe as like these tech companies were. It was the gambling part. Right. Mm -hmm. And so once you started to understand um, that the way in which uh, digital systems of surveillance, sensor networks feed signals intelligence, right, uh, intelligence about individual and social behaviors that would both feed into um, strategic decisions that are militarized decisions or financial market decisions. There are other, you know, many aspects of this and both, you know, Michael Bloomberg, who I think is, is equally as dangerous and doesn't get nearly the billing as Bill Gates, you know, that was his background is data analytics and controlling urban populations. So, so that was sort of how I, I came into it. And I just, like, I just taught myself, I mean, literally my background is in art history and cultural landscapes. So like what I was trained to do was just read primary source material and mm -hmm. then sort of synthesize it, right? Like that's sort of what art, the art part is, is that you you look at things symbolically, right? And then I get presented with things. I'm just, it's put right in front of me. And I'm like, oh, this is where this piece of the puzzle fits in. This is how these things come together. And I fortunately have a, a situation where I'm a bit outside it. Like my work doesn't depend on me not knowing it. And I would say for most people who are in a similar position, it's very hard to get out of bed every day if you have to go to a job that you realize is building the singularity, you know, yeah. a militarized singularity. So yeah. you just really don't want to know. You don't want to know. So really, for me, it was looking at LinkedIn profiles, you know, watching four hours of the World Bank New America Blockchain Summit, you know, mm -hmm. looking at their white papers because they all tell you yeah. it's not actually hidden. If I mean, you know, I mean, if you have the time to read and you believe them, then it just it just they figure nobody would come into their space reading their stuff if they didn't go along with it. Mm -hmm. And so some of us are the outliers, right, that 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 read it and go, wait, this is actually abominable, you know, and that's sort of where, yeah, I taught myself. And it's hard because people are like, it's so hard. And I'm like, I know, but like, I'm just a mom. I figured it out. If you're motivated enough, you you will. But I'm working on a glossary. I promise. Like. That's the next thing. I, I have bits and pieces of a glossary, but I'm looking to update that. Yeah, I think that's that's a great idea. Just a place where people can go and say, what? Yeah, when I see these terms for the first time, how do I decode? It is a different language, and if, and so you know, it, it, you have it, people who go to work at a very large company have that experience. Where on their first day, they're like, I don't know what people are talking about. There's all these new acronyms, all these systems and processes that are being described. It's the same thing that is true in this network of think tanks and big multinational companies when they talk about stakeholders and all these weird things. So yeah, a glossary is a fantastic idea. Um, but people and people need to be motivated to look at that glossary and to have this conversation because it is not just that those conversations are some academic, you know, futurist, 
uh, sitting in an ivory tower somewhere saying, well, we could build this system and wouldn't it be cool? It's like these are our actually agendas that are being implemented and executed on. Like you mentioned, the um, the UN has already rolled out the blockchain digital currency for refugees. Right. So to, so expand on that a little bit, just the, the fact that this is a real-time situation, the immediacy of all of these programs and, and terms that are being thrown around being rolled out now. Yeah. So I would say it really helped me because – once you get the schema, like once you understand, you can you can have some basic decoding of the language and you know the playbook, you can apply the playbook across sectors, right? Mm -hmm. So my immersion experience was around schools, right? They wanted children on dashboards with devices and they wanted to separate them from their teachers. And because the teachers wouldn't enter as much data as a device could, and then that's what was going to run these markets. And so when I started to hear about like even in urban settings around food systems, oh, you know, for example, Comcast wanted to put Internet of Things water temperature sensors in our garden. <laughs> and we we're like, no, we don't do like we grow soil, actually. Like that's that's it's you don't put, you know, and 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 then a funder was like, well, you know, you could turn this all into hydroponics. I'm like, no, that's not the point. Like the point <laughs> is actually being connected on land in relationship amongst each other. And and then I started thinking, and then I looked into, oh, Comcast, which is headquartered here in Philly, we have two giant skyscrapers and they're running all the education data, but they also are getting drones. They're doing drone agriculture. So essentially what farmers and plants and you know the various environmental elements of agricultural systems are exactly like a classroom. They're like teachers, don't mess with those dirty children. They might have diseases or grow, you know, put them on a device or a tablet and then you go over here, over there and then watch them through your device. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's what they wanna do to agricultural systems, whether it's plants or livestock, like you don't actually want to touch those messy things. Go put them over there, track them on the devices, which creates vast, um, you know, new revenue sources for the data companies, the cloud computing companies, the technology companies, like these are all verticals for them to profit from. But then both ultimately on both sides, all of that data is getting thrown into this thing that they want to use to build a singularity, which mm -hmm. was the piece I didn't have really until the last maybe four or five months was the way in which they are literally mining life processes on this planet, both human and animal and plant and microbiome to build a virtual replica that they can control. Like if, they, if we think that they can control us in a totality in a blockchain based material world, the digital twin version is going to be even more under their control. Mm -hmm. And that that piece is kind of crazy to imagine, but I mean, that's literally what they're doing. Absolutely. And yeah, let's highlight that a little bit more. This idea that they, you can hear it described as augmented reality, where they, they have, because of the Internet of Things, constantly reporting all the data in. They build this mirror. They call, sometimes they call it a twin, um, right. twinning your, your twin factory. And so once we learn, we put sensors in your factory. They, they, like you said, they, they talk about it's the same basic principles, whether it's the children or the plants or your factory. We're going to divorce people from the process and install sensors to collect the data. The people can then step back and monitor for now. Later, we'll have AI and it'll be a post-human situation completely. Uh, so it's so what we're witnessing across all these sectors is the divorce of people from from the land, from the children, from the, the manufacturing, all of these things. Um, where were we going with that? So, so okay, so they, they talk about in each of these situations the twinning that we're constructing that vir that virtual reality, augmented reality structure that mirrors you. And more and more, as we get better data and better algorithms, we'll be able to um, to have predictive value and then tell you how to tweak that. And that's where, as you were saying, that's where it becomes not just a perfect surveillance, but a perfect control where we feed back from this twin digital augmented reality thing back into physical reality. And so that's how AI can actually take control over our, over where we live, right? Well, and I think, you know, part of, you know, when people are looking at the technocracy, this idea of energy credits, right? You know, the Black Mirror episodes of inputs and outputs, like how much are you contributing versus how much are you sucking up and these different mm -hmm. things. But mm -hmm. once you have these blockchain systems and you start to have smart data analytics on what goes in and what comes out both, um, and, and understanding that managing the function of biological processes are also going to start to be markets um, in eugenics and, and that the GMOs are actually moving to a point of like, you know, building vaccines or medical things into food systems, maybe yes. getting to a point that that's what I keep talking about, these passporting systems that folks talk about. 
guys, it's not going to be injections for very long. It's going to be part of like a larger geoengineering project or an edible market, like the, a biosensor. So don't adopt the language they give you because that they give you that language for a reason. You have to cut to the chase. And ultimately, it's about, um, you know, real time biodata, like through, you know, the biosensors or the nanotechnologies that they have. Um, but literally, you know, they can track, you know, a number of months ago, I, I, we came across, and we've probably talked about it, the DNA nudge band that came out of Imperial College London. And people are like, well, I would never use, and they're linked to COVID testing, um, right? And so they're like, well, I would never do that, you know? And I'm like, it's not going to be a choice because you're going to be on food stamps. And they're going to say the only way you can get your food. It's not going to be, oh, that's a nice you know, value added thing for you that you have an option. It's that all of the people who are dispossessed and then made dependence on the state will have to get their food through a DNA nudge band, right? And that is the tracking. And then wait till they queue up the smart toilets. So then they get you at the other end and your biosensors and, and then track you during the day in your smart shirt to see how productive you were um, or your haptic suits. And it's that level of crunching. And as you said, they, it, right now, there is still somewhat of a human interface at some point down the line, but you know they're talking about decentralized autonomous organizations, right? Like companies that run on computer code with no recourse of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I think, can I contest that decision of my smart toilet? Like you're not gonna get that choice if it's a DAO. So, um, you know, all of the things, and I really wish that people who were more familiar with like the issues around, um, you know, the prison industry, could get up to speed on this because they're turning the world into the prison planet, like the prison reform, they're moving that model because they have the new model in place, which is a global e-carceration model. Mm -hmm. They don't need the ankle bracelets, right? They don't need that anymore. They have way more place, ways even in your environment, the spatial web to track you in it. They don't actually need the bracelet anymore. And that's what people, I think they're just not getting their head around yet. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some people are starting to hear the fringe conversation around Internet of Things, uh, connectivity, putting the su supply chain and the blockchain. But that's a much more comfortable conversation than going from IoT to IOB, the Internet of Bodies, which, of course, the World Economic Forum is really hot on and uh, goes into the, some of the biodigital convergence you're talking about. You posted the other day to your blog, again, wrenchinthegears.com, the, uh, the Canadian document that was entitled Exploring Biodigital bio Convergence. And I'm going to read just a little quote because it speaks exactly what you're talking about. While I'm brushing my teeth, Jamie, my personal AI, asks if I'd like a delivery drone to pick up my daughter's baby tooth, which fell out two days ago. The epigenetic markers in child, children's teeth have to be analyzed and cataloged on our family genetic blockchain. In order to qualify for the health rebate. So I need that done today. I replaced my smart sticker that monitors all my blood chemistry, da, da, da. And uh, also, I, I admit that it sounds kind of gross, but it's a really good thing that we finally have our smart sewers, the municipal sampling our fecal matter from the sewage pipes. It's part of the platform to analyze data on a nutritional diversity, gut bacteria, there's that biome, and antibiotic use to aid with public health screening and fight antibiotic resistant strains of you know, public safety. It's all about public safety. So you hear, I mean, this is, this is them envisioning this perfect data awareness down to your children's teeth the day they fall out. Um, you, you talk a little bit about the Internet of Bodies and where you see this going. Well, so maybe I can say just a little bit about the social impact investing. Yeah. So in this premise, again, there's these two sections. It's all tied in with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, right, mm -hmm. which sound good until you actually know what they're talking about. And two thirds of those goals are actually about managing people in poverty, and then there's some over on the side that are about managing water and the climate and other things, but it's far fewer than, than you would think. It's mostly about managing people and then also managing people in relation to the environment. So One Health is the World Bank's effort to essentially dis disconnect people from nature to say it's for our protection and the protection of nature that we be totally separate as opposed to living within you know interconnected ecosystems. And so this idea of impact investing is based on a predictive predictive profiling deficit model. That each person, even before they're born, based on crunching data about their parents or their where they live, will be a burden on society, will cost society a certain fixed amount. And that if you can have um, an intervention that's tied to a government contract that's outsourced to a nonprofit to fix you preemptively before you've even done anything, then that creates a narrow strip of return on investment for in private investment companies. So this is the Goldman Sachs, this is the Vatican Bank, SoftBank, big insurance companies. 
A lot of them are going to be healthcare companies, and a lot of it is being framed as preventative healthcare, including food access. Okay, so the diabetes, mm -hmm. all of that. Diabetes is going to be totally weaponized, and that's why the lead-in to um, you know the last year's health situation hit so hard on chronic illness. So by diabetes, heart disease, asthma, these chronic conditions that are going to be resolved through um, this internet of body sensors with these evidence-based interventions. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the impact market. So essentially what it does is allow permanent surveillance of targeted communities because they've got to get your data. It's like, you know, the AI is watching you as you brush your teeth. You, you don't get away from it. it. It pervades your entire life. And there's no incentive to ever make it right because their market, their bets, depend on the problem existing. And so you just grow poverty and trauma over time, okay? And when they talk about the tooth markers for epigenetics, it's actually a, a, a very deep eugenic element. And someone, when I, um, in December, we, we were doing an action and I was having a conversation and they said, and it was very telling, they said, you know, the crown interest, the royalty, you know, they're very into breeding, right, animals dogs, horses, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so there is this deep eugenics, like optimization that is built into this, right? Uh, plant societies, right? The fancy plants and, and the hybridization. And so they're going to use this epigenetic trauma uh, within, you know, historical systems of oppression to feed these impact markets. And that's why they need the epigenetics. And it's really like biopiracy and data mining. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's all layered in together and food is a huge part of it because then they'll start to say, well, based on your epigenetics, this is what you have to eat. Yep. But the idea is, is that what's coming is a post-human world, really. So what is eugenics where the goal is a post-human world? In my mind, the goal of that level of eugenics is to create people as shells, as as just shells of human beings that you can manage. It's not it's not like the the idealized, strong, virile person, you know, will do the, you know, work or fight the wars. No, you kind of just want a crippled person who will behave. And, and that is sort of where I'm at now in my thinking about both eugenics and epigenetic trauma and the food, is that yeah. they, will, they will design your food to make you into that. Yeah, there's no, I mean, that's what Bertrand Russell told us, is it would be diet injections and injunctions that will conspire to create a, a, a you know, worker class, right, that we can't do anything. Um, I want to make sure we nailed the, so just the basic idea of human capital finance there, because you said that there are going to be companies, you know, you, you also mentioned that hedge funds were somehow very involved in yeah. in the uh, education aspects up front. So, um, so people need to get that idea that, they are. It's this is just as they just turned water into futures, and now that it's the financialization of everything, but now extending right into us, into our identity, into our social outcomes. If you do better in school than you were expected to do based on your genetic markers, then they say, well, it's because uh, you know McDonald's put a play place right next to you and gave you play opportunities, and somehow and then they get financially <laughs> rewarded. So they, there's, I mean, there's plenty we could say about just how ridiculous that is, and how any metric once you once it becomes a target ceases to be a useful metric, right? How they just game the system to make whatever outcomes it seems like. But uh, is, that a, is that a good basic like rundown of how to think yeah, of human I, capital I, finance? Yeah, I didn't miss the hedge fund piece. So essentially what happens is that they predictably profile you against an existing cost, like prison, uh, depression, uh, diabetes. There's a cost and the academic institution set that price. And then they do the difference between fixing you and what it would cost if you had a full blown episode of either being incarcerated or, you know, and, but the money to be made isn't in that small return on investment because most people would say, well, I don't really buy that you're going to make a lot of money in poverty, right? That just doesn't seem like if you were going to go for a place to make money, that doesn't seem like a good buy, right? Like why is Goldman Sachs getting into pre-K? Um, but really when they're going to securitize the debt the investors that are putting the money have plans to do all of the securitization on blockchain, actually. And um, and then that's when the hedge funds will start to trade it. OK. And so there's already systems in place uh, that New Jersey has a program called career impact bonds where they're using income sharing agreements. And so people who've been pushed out of work due to lockdowns are now being reskilled into big pharma a coding uh, alternative energy to do the fourth industrial revolution. But the income sharing agreements are going to be securitized. 
and surprise, surprise, Phil Murphy, the governor of, of uh, New Jersey, is a 27-year Goldman Sachs executive, right? So there, it's all set up. And and just as an example on how twisted this becomes, several years ago, Utah is a hotbed of a lot of this. Um, it's both state intelligence and LDS and you know tech, University of Utah. And so a lot of the pilots are in Salt Lake City, and they had one for pre-K. And they gathered, um, a, they had a winter summit with Ian Galloway of the San Francisco Fed, because this is going through the central banking systems. And this um, panel was about youth recidivism, like juvenile delinquents, right? But the Q&A opened at the end, and there was a woman in the audience, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm listening to all of this. I work at a Salt Lake City food bank, and, you know, I know that none of these outcomes are going to be good if people are hungry, right? Mm -hmm. And none of you guys ever talk about hunger, which is Goal number two, <laughs> you know, of the UN Sustainable Development Goal number two is hunger. You never talk about hunger. And I don't get it because none of your other programs are going to work if people are hungry. And so their response, like, like they sort of paused and then Galloway said, well, you know, the thing about pay for success finance, which is what they call it, um, is that we need a cost offset and we haven't figured out the cost offset for hunger. OK, so you're only going to feed people if you can find the appropriate cost offset. And this was maybe three or four years ago. And he said, maybe test scores. Maybe if we can tie feeding children to like their third grade test scores, that could be the cost offset. And what was so depressing was like the woman was just so grateful to have found a way to fit into the system, like yes. for her program. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, OK, well, as long as I can get my stuff in the system, nobody in this room of ostensibly people, you know, which is a deeply faith based community, mm -hmm. like had the temerity to raise their hand to the Federal Reserve and say, but wait a minute, like it's actually not like moral to condition children's access to food on a test score, people. And, and, and that's where this goes. And so all of the nice language, the way they talk about it, no one wants to peel back like, oh, hey, but the conversation when you actually unpack it looks like this, right? right. It looks like right. kids performing behaviors that um, the state or corporations decide are approved behaviors. And then increasingly they're trackable in these in this digital panopticon. Mm -hmm. And that children are being um, groomed from the age of two or three years old to accept that this is normal. Exactly. And so you can call it a social credit score or a, a digital currency that's that's uh, with behavioral controls. It's only going to allow you to purchase the things the system wants you to. You know, there's there's a number of different ways to language this, but th that's the bottom line is this is control <laughs> over what people are doing. And so I appreciate you saying that. Um, I have you've, to say, like, I've had a bit of a run in. I just want to mention like like. Because I didn't come at this from health, right? And so, like, clearly the the health freedom, the wellness communities are have very loud voices right now. And right now, there there are a lot of people who are pointing fingers on the wellness side about people who they feel are not making good health choices, right? Like those people, because they feel attacked around, um, you know, the current <laughs> health scenario. That those people are saying, well, why should you be afraid of me? I'm super healthy. And look at you, you're not doing good health behaviors, right? You're not eating right, or you're smoking, or doing these things. I'm like, that's exactly what they want us to do: is turn on one another, right. is not deal with structural problems around global supply chains and food access. And also policing other people's health choices. Like none of us, in my opinion, should ultimately be policing other. We should give people access, make access affordable, support people in sharing information to give people the best options, especially children. But the policing of each other and the policing of behaviors is exactly what the impact investors want us to do, because that is the narrative where it's going, is let us tell you how to be healthy. And we're going to dictate it and track it on blockchain. Mm -hmm. When you say, I've heard you say that food is central to this entire technocratic agenda. Can you just expound on that? Well, so I'm like, I read a book, um, Nick Estes, um, and it's called Our, Our Past is the Future, Our History of the Future. I think it, it's about Standing Rock, it's about the Lakota. And essentially, for me, because, you know, like I'm in Pennsylvania, Carlisle Indian School is here, right? And this idea of, um, destruction of families, cultural erasure, and taking people's food systems is to me like foundational. If we need to learn lessons, like to me, it feels like now we're at the ghost dance, you know, for, for all of humanity. And part of the way we accomplished this movement across the continent was to kill off the buffalo, to kill off the food sources. And then later, 
um, in the 20th century, even the Pick Sloan dams, using um, public work systems to flood out bottomlands, to flood out places where people who had um, more subsistence or forage level types of access to um, the bounties of nature were pushed out of that, right? And so I feel like very strongly, while many people look to China or look to these other places, that actually we need to look closer to home because this idea of cutting off um, food access to one's normal cultural food traditions, and I feel very strongly that this homogenization of a global diet or a vegan diet or a cricket is, is, is denying the cultural and the human aspect of one's food systems and trying to homogenize that, which is the entirely the wrong thing. Yes. And then to control it, because what they did was they put people, they removed them off their land to a place that they did not have a relationship with those food, not just food, but medicines, right? Because they were using a lot of plant medicines and other things, and then gave them food rations that made them sick and gave them disease and often didn't, and then didn't give them at all, right? And so to me, like that is a profound lesson. And and again, they did not fully accomplish this erasure. I mean, it was largely a genocidal process, but the, I, I do believe that there are lessons to be learned from that history in this moment is if we have a larger reckoning with what does it mean to be in relation to your food system in a reciprocal arrangement and how does one um, you know, because I'm not vegetarian, right? And, and and I have a lot of people who would sort of point fingers and I say, I would much prefer having a good, a better food system, right? A local, a regional food system, a system that is really sustainable, that is not about robots cutting up chickens and sending them halfway around the world and back and the dull fruit cups, all of that, right? But yes. that is a larger reckoning that I think requires us to have a, a broader understanding of the historical systems of how we relate to food both from, from the original people to immigrants to this country to all the way forward up until like, you know, the 50s when manufactured food systems really kicked into high gear with the suburbs and everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And so how do you see people, how do you see food, access to food being used um, for most people? Like how can they expect that to, to, to see that roll out? I mean, I think a lot of us are already seeing it. I mean, mm -hmm. I actually... I really don't do the mask thing. And so my like part, my spouse like has been going grocery shopping and like I actually had to go on Monday because we were out of town and I hadn't been in a grocery store for like the better part of a year. And just the shelves are, you know, there's like a third of the shelf space that is empty. You know, it's very clear. And then most of the people who were in there were like shopping for online shopping, right? There were like not many. Um, so, you know, I've seen this coming. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, we may have sort of different positionings on this. I see that there's two paths. I mean, there's certainly the importance of people um, being able to reclaim their food systems to the extent to which they're able to secure land or secure resources. But the other piece is the more I understand about geoengineering, right? Like weaponized weather systems, the nanotechnology. Um, I don't know how sustainable that is to find some place when what we're realizing is that the prison planet is run by satellites, right? Like if if last year the Harvard Business Review was talking about macro eyes tracking African children from space uh, to, to predict vaccine uptake, um, I don't know how realistic it is unless you go hide in a cave to make that happen, which is, I'm not saying that there isn't, um, <sighs> Like that, it's not fulfilling to go, have a garden, right? To right, have right. nourish your soul and to keep connected and to like have a community garden and be with that in and of itself is wonderful. But I just don't know what the long term prospects are. So I think some of us have to contest it all the way down because I don't think it there's anywhere to run from mm -hmm. this thing that's coming. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Like no, I don't know. It, be fully prepared for this. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I saw. I think I saw that tweet where you said I see farmer is is maybe too optimistic about this. I don't know. The nanotech is everywhere. You're not going to outrun it. Um, so but it's a good question. Get in the water cycle. I mean, yep. that's the thing. Like the the National Nanotechnology Institute, like Penn, just got an NSF grant for biotech in the soil. Like they don't. I mean, I'm sure they actually do know what they're doing. But it's terrifying because, like, I, you know, I've. I, talk to people in the water, water department, which is very progressive. And I'm like, do you know about nanotech in the water? And they're like, no, we're still dealing with microplastics. And I'm like, think smaller. Yeah. It's going smaller. Like once it's in the water cycle, what do you do, you know? 
Yeah. Well, I just I, I did want to thank you for calling me optimistic. That's the first time I've, I've heard Ice Age Farmer is, opt- <laughs> is optimistic. But um, but no, so the broader question. OK, so yeah, so we can't outrun this nanotech and this ridiculous agenda. What what do you do, Allison? What what solutions do you see? Well, I um, all I can say, like, I think each person has to have their own reckoning. With it. I mean, Um, You know, I've heard people recently say like, oh, I'm controlled opposition or I'm telling people the wrong thing. Like, listen, guys, I'm not trying to lead anybody anywhere. I'm trying to figure stuff out and provide a narrative frame that I think does resonate with some people, doesn't resonate with other people. It's fine. You know, this isn't my livelihood. Um, It feels like sort of a, like I said, a spiritual engagement, even though I'm not an organized religion person, but it feels like something bigger. Whatever I've stumbled into, I thought it was school closures and it turns out it's like transhumanism, but okay. We'll go with that. And so right. <laughs> um, Saturday, I went up to New York and they had the, you know, the, the demonst- you know, the rallies or whatever um, around the world. And, um, you know, I gave a speech on Foley Square and it was the site of the African burial grounds. And and actually, it's, it's interesting. So um, that wasn't their their former location. And when I looked at Google Maps, this was it. And I said, wow, that's like we actually should acknowledge the ancestors in this. This is like something quite significant, this location. And as a percent for art program in this park, um, they had a statue. Now, the Foley Square is surrounded by all of these federal buildings, um, the Social Security, the IRS, the New York State Supreme Court, the municipal buildings. Like it's kind of, now that we know totalitarian, it's quite a dominating set of architecture like around the sort of the, uh, international trade courts, right? All in this space. And then in the center of the circle that's being rung by these buildings is an art installation. And his name was Lorenzo Pace, did this piece of artwork, and it was called The Triumph of the Human Spirit. And it was actually a a granite ship that was meant to represent the Middle Passage, but on it was an abstracted figure called a chihuahua, which is an an African antelope, it's a headpiece normally for um, fertility and agriculture. And that was in the middle of the circle. And I said, that's it, guys. Like, this is what we're fighting for. Like, for the most part, people were there because they understood a relatively narrow subset of what was happening, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they understood it as, um, you know, and I don't mean to dismiss this. We we need to grow this understanding. But they understood the medical passports or the controlling of people's movements. But I said, it's actually life. It 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 is fertility, it is reproduction, it is agriculture, it is about all of that. And that is what we fight for is in this space. And so, you know, you've probably seen on my Twitter, I've had people sending me dandelions. I had this vision um, this spring and, and the dandelions came to me and I said, you know, how do we feel like we have agency? Because for me, like, and I'm an older person, so I'm in my fifties. I don't want to fit in this thing. I would rather be the one who is peacefully saying, nope, I'm not, I don't think this is it. This is not what we should do mm-hmm. for the people who can't. And um, so I said, send me dandelions, you know, because, it, symbolically, well, they're free. <laughs> they're everywhere. They're on every continent, and they're they they have the symbolism, right? And they have they're connected to medicinals, and they're edible. And so I've been having people send me dandelions from Switzerland, from you know Idaho, from Vermont, for you know, and, I, and so we took them and we called out Wall Street. Like after this thing, we walked down, and we people can see it on my YouTube channel, and it was just about twenty of us. But we had like we taught each other about what the hell was actually happening. And we intervened trying to like energetically into the space with plant medicine, essentially, to say, no, there's something else that this is the, whatever this profane thing that is that you're trying to turn the world into a planetary computer. Not about that. Um, and so that might be just very naive. And I'm not trying to put down people who are tra- have more ambitious plans. Um, I love my city. I don't want to run away because I would actually, I think I would be bad at it, <laughs> you know? And actually in the Robo Apocalypse book, there's a book called Robo, which sounds terrible, but it's better than you would think. And in the end, when like the robots took over, it was a pretty good book. They said all the people in New York who like ran to the Catskills and didn't know what the hell they were doing, like they were, they did not fare very well. They said the people who stayed in New York and like tipped over cars and made obstacle courses for the robots, like, because they knew their terrain, like they did better. And so now I'm like, I don't actually want to give up the thing that I used to love about my city. I'd like to, I prefer to fight for it, which is not everybody's choice. I'm not saying everybody has to make the right, same choice, but that's the choice I'm making for now anyway. 
for sure. Yeah. And well, it's the right choice to fight. And that's the choice we're all going to be making. I agree. It's going to take everyone. We all have unique voices. We come from different backgrounds and experiences. And so the way we, we do that, the way we engage this and try and spread the word uh, is, is going to look different. And so I think the bottom line is as long as, as, long as we're all doing everything we can. So we, we definitely have talked about food. And I've talked a lot about food. I would really like to invite you to talk a little bit more about education and the kids, like the play table that quantifies the way they in, uh, interact with it, just to help give people some more insight into uh, what's going on there and to warn parents as well. Yeah. Well, so I would encourage people if, if they have time. So there's something called the Moonshot Project or the Moonshot Goals, which is the Japan Science and Technology Agency. So the government of Japan, which is SoftBank and Nippon Telegraph and Telephone. And they're talking digital twinning, 6G. And they're saying like, hey, um, by 2050, we're going to live outside of having a physical mind and body in time and space. Right. Which sounds crazy. But I'm like, guys, like. And, and totally people have had pie in the sky ideas about cybernetics for a very long time. Like, I'm not trying to be chicken little here, but I'm like, I think we should actually try to engage with this material and say, it's not our preference. Like we'd really not, rather not live as a cartoon character in a, a militarized video game if we can right. help it. Right. Um, and we're not probably, like I'm not gonna be one of those people, but they want the children because they want to normalize that, right? Absolutely. And a yeah. lot of it is about um, behavioral nudging, digital nudges, and um, this game of human capital bonds is based on sort of setting people on pathways of self-improvement, right? Whether your pathway of self-improvement is, is around weight loss or physical activity or addiction treatment or workforce training or mental health, like they're going to give you a task list and then check that you've you know, done all of the things. And someone's betting that you do them and somebody's betting that you don't do them. And they wanna condition children to that from these very earliest ages. So. What we're going to see coming under the Biden presidency, which has been like long time in coming and it's fully bipartisan, um, you know, and if anything, I think Trump was meant to inflame people to further make them partisan so we couldn't come together, yes. um, is that they want this children as human capital because this is the generation that is going to um, live in the digital prison if they get what they want. Mm -hmm. And they would really like a lot of them elementary and middle school kids to be trained up to code the digital prison, especially the ones in Africa and India who will do it at a cheap price. Um, and so they've got these programs to pay for pre-K, right? Which sounds great because we have an economic system now, which is very hard to get by on one income family, right? One income household. You need multiple, two, three, four incomes to support people, you know, especially in urban areas. So like, hey, affordable childcare is important. Well, the thing is they want your kid from early ages. And I will say as someone who was like recovering liberal and then left and now homeless, is like the conservatives are right. They do want your kids. They really want your kids. Mm -hmm. And um, so Jim Heckman is this uh, Nobel Prize winning economist at University of Chicago. So it's all the Chicago boys, right? And mm -hmm. you will appreciate this because they really look at humans as commodities. So it's the commodities futures market. And while in New York, we went to the stock exchange, I said, hey, it's not really the stock exchange, it's the commodities exchange that this is gonna run It's Chicago. So Heckman is funded by Soros um, and J.B. Pritzker, who's the governor of Illinois. And they're the ones who have been setting up blockchain, talking about putting blo uh, SNAP food assistance on blockchain and coding it to make you buy the things that they want you to buy. And um, they said, OK, well, we've got this equation now. We can get a 7 to 10 percent rate of return on early childhood investments or up to 13 if you get health data. Right. So we're going to see like smart playgrounds like um, uh, who is it? Bechtel, the defense contractor. They're funding something called Playworks with rubrics for recess. OK, so like when the militarized defense sector gets into recess, you know that there is a problem. Right. Um, so they went all up and down to, to sell these bonds because like. Well, 7 to 10 isn't great, but it's pretty good for like a conservative thing. So they're going to throw all these kids on blockchain to get under the guise of getting them pre-K. And these, these programs have been set up in, like I said, Salt Lake City um, Social Impact Bond was the first one. Um, but how do you get the data? And what Heckman has said was like, we can't change cognitive data because IQ, if you believe in that, hardens up around the age 8 to 10. And it doesn't move for hedge funds because really these aren't kids. It's data on a dashboard that represents a child. So they would say, well, you know what we can change? We can change character. We can change character. Essentially, they can digitally brainwash kids and track it 
and move the data on a dashboard around their character um, in terms of good behavior, and then take this credit, take the credit, the return on investment for this bet that they've made. Well, how, where do they get the data? Well, now they've developed things. Um, Hatch Education has a We Play Smart Table. And this We Play Smart Table is sort of, if you picture a large screen TV parallel to the ground with two dimensional puzzle pieces or things. And the children are supposed to play together. It's not a single game. They're supposed to interact because they want their social, emotional data. And there are cameras, Fish Eye Lens cameras, two of them on either corner of the table mm -hmm. to track and for the children as human capital, right? And the craziest thing is that they most want social emotional data. Um, and I believe it is because they want to use that data to train the robots, which sounds crazy, but all of it is built on machine learning. And the more social emotional data that they can get, the more behavioral data they can get, um, a lot of these deals, like I was just talking about Cardano in Ethiopia, putting 5 million students on blockchain, um, they're partnered with Ben Gertzel and SingularityNet and OpenCog, which is so Hanson Robotics, Sophia the Robot. I mean, I they haven't straight up said it, but like they're also, UNICEF is all over Africa and India doing virtual reality education. They're going to put those things on those kids' headsets and suck their biometrics out and feed them to the robots. I mean, that is where this road goes if we don't refuse it. So, you know, it sounds in, it, it sounds ridiculous that I would yes. even have to talk about this, right? right? It sounds perfectly ridiculous, but like I will even say Heckman had a whole conference, and this is interesting, at University of Chicago, oak panel room, all the people in the room, and one of the guys says, we can't get the parents to make the kids use the apps. This is like PBS Kids apps, like those Daniel the Tiger Tea Party, don't put your kids on those apps. And he said, we can't, the parents say that they're gonna do it and they never do. And Heckman said, well, you know, he's like in his 70s and he invited everyone there. And he said, you know, but they need, you're acting as if parents are experts and they're not. Um, you need to just gamify it for the parents, like a build a kid game. And, um, but you need a good incentive. This is all behavioral economics. This is Sunstein and Thaler. A good incentive like pornography, a good incentive like and then you could see everyone's head sort of pivot and like kind of, did he just say that, right? And he's like, well, just kind of kidding about the pornography, but I mean, a good incentive, <laughs> like really a good incentive. And so this is the headspace. Now I will say Educare is the pre-K franchise Head Start Kids. He was talking about the kids of Head Start parents in particular. Mm -hmm. um, they're being used in Tulsa. Tulsa is a test bed for a lot of this. It's the George Kaiser, who is the Bank of Oklahoma, big oil, He's backing Educare in Tulsa. That's where they have the surveillance play tables. The head of his foundation is Ken Levitt, who was the former advisor to George Tenet of the CIA. And this is the 100th anniversary of the race massacre in Tulsa last year. They've got the kids on surveillance play tables. So these historical systems of domination like thread through, and I think that's what I can bring to it because I come from like what is a landscape, right? Like what is the history and what, where does this lay on the land? What is the geography and, and what are the layers? Like let's peel back these layers because um, for the most part, I think people today are really trained to think in pretty narrow terms. Very. And that's yeah. why they get away with everything because yep. no one thinks bigger. No one sees how it all connects. Yeah, oh, they're just- microbiome. Can I say one more thing? Absolutely. The other thing is, if you go to, it's called the Human Capital Economic Opportunities Group at the University of Chicago, HCEO, James Heckman. He has a YouTube channel. I think I actually have more subscribers, which makes me feel better. But beyond the social emotional um, learning conference that he hosted, he had one on the microbiome, okay? He had a whole one on that, like epigenetics and social justice of the microbiome, right? So these people, the same people who want to engineer your kids on the surveillance play tables, their brain, they're going to they're going to manage your gut. They are totally going to manage your gut and your brain. OK. And the other piece of this is like, again, um, you know, gut brain health. There are issues around spectrum disorder, right? Like with the, the gut aspect um, with a lot of this nanotech, biotech is also it's the U.S., Israel, U.K. connections, uh, you know, tech transfer. Um, the IDF in Israel has a whole unit. There's the 8200 that everybody knows about, which has its own social impact accelerator. All of its alumni have their own social impact accelerator to use their tech. But they have the 990 unit, which is satellite um, systems like analysis. And they specifically recruit young people on the spectrum to do that work. 
because they have a brain that can focus like that. <laughs> like high functioning spectrum because they have a focus to sit down and track the kids in Africa from space. Right. And so if you understand this idea of engineering, using one's gut, using one's um, eating food systems to engineer um, brain function to carry out the construction of this digital empire. Like, I think that's where it's going. It's not, it's let me just pause you one second. Cause I want to, I want to make sure actually the plug you named a bunch of relationships and people there, and I wanted to mention that she's not just throwing these things out and enumerating them or making stuff up. There are um, she's crafted these these you know, like mind maps is one word from these graphs of the connections and the people. Uh, Allison has a collection of these which are amazing and they're fantastic research and they're worth checking out, and they are like isomorphic. They mirror the ones that I've done ex exploring the, the relationships between Rockefeller and the world. You know, um, it's, it just looks exactly the same. The same people, the same players, the same funding. For the food systems takeover, you can do the same thing for the COVID takeover. And, uh, all of the people who tried to rush out tests to farm workers first, it was the same same companies aligning with Alphabet and, and Google and trying to get this stuff out there. Um, there's another reason I knew we had to have this conversation because our, our world's there's like a thousand touch points for these conversations. And then they disappeared all my maps. I yes. mean, now they're in they're in my my blogs, and I I'm have many of them yeah. on the Wayback Machine. But yeah. I mean, this this it was through littlesis.org, which I, I, I <laughs> urge caution. I mean, I you know I have four years worth of crowdsourced data that I've added in there. But yeah, I mean, it shows you once you actually see the relationships how significant that is that they just wipe them all, whoop, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but they're still in my blogs, and you know I, I have links in the Wayback Machine. And they tell a they tell a very compelling story, and just you know, the other, some of the other stuff you threw out there was the the singularity net. These are people that are constructing like a, a set of standards which functions as an API between different artificial intelligence agents. So you can have one AI that reaches out to other AIs and it's, it, it talks to each other and asks for help. Um, so one AI can actually become like a domain expert of farm status and like moisture, soil moisture, and one. One AI would uh, reach out to it when it needs the data. So companies, you can imagine companies, it's going to be like a competition of which AI is a domain expert for which thing. And then they're going to have these blockchain based currencies where they trade to do transactions to ask each other's expert systems little questions. Uh, it's an incredible AI ecosystem that they have, that they're building. It's not just imagine, they're building this now, working and on that experts. augmented reality. Go ahead, yeah. That's what they have to put it in warehouses and freight containers, right? Like, I mean, soon local agriculture is going to be like a stack of freight container boxes in the Walmart parking lot, operated, run on phones. And, and my concern is, so now DuPont is working in the microbiome space as well, which is mm -hmm. very concerning, okay? And so if you imagine that if you if you can grow, I put air quotes around food, um, in an air, hydroponic or an aeroponic environment, right, that is custom maybe with the chemicals that you want in it, but that doesn't have any of its own natural microbiome. And I know you've talked a bit about the like tracking soils and, you know, the tracking through the global supply chains, not even needing the sensors anymore. But mm -hmm. if you if you can create a blank slate of food matter that really doesn't have any nutrition in it, and then you overlay your neutral nutraceutical, right? Like here's your custom, like your AI when you're brushing your teeth, your you know biosensor says here's your you know 3D printed food goo, you know according to what the, your most up to date you know sensor profile is, um, you know it it takes this whole idea of food as medicine, which I think a lot of people again in the wellness space think about, but they're not actually realizing that it's aiming to actually use the GMOs to bioengineer people. Yes. Straight yeah, up. they just, and oh, it's Hippocrates, direct. let thy food be the medicine. No, 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 we're talking about uh, the, the, yeah, it was GMO vaccine, edible vaccines. The Russians had a, an edible COVID-19 vaccine that they talked about. Um, and this is, you know, when the Rockefeller Foundation Reset the Table doc comes out and it says we want a health based, health outcome based food system that's going to be sustainable and equitable. We're going to expand SNAP benefits through the roof, which is talking about this other oh. weaponizing social um, um, assistance programs. And yeah, and we're going to have food as medicine was one of the, the biggest bullet points in that whole agenda. And it doesn't make sense. That's why we have to have this conversation because it doesn't make <laughs> sense if, again, if you just talk about, well, it, it sounds like they want healthier food. No, no, no. This is, it, it, once you start looking at the rest of these people and, and the conversations that are happening, you see that these are all, the words they're using in the agendas and the architects, sure, that they're building all hooks together. And it is this perfect prison as you've described it. Yeah. Could I say something about another story about UNICEF? 
Sure. So I have. A, I, I don't know how long we have. Do we have? Oops. Oh gosh, I'm realizing my light is not great. Just a second here. I will. <laughs> let me just do this. The, the sun is shining on me. Sorry. Like it's all right. That. You got the uh, Empire Strikes Back, turn to the dark side kind of a. Oh, no. Okay. All right. This is better. Um, I didn't see myself in here. So um, anyway, so when I was just doing school stuff, and this is how things thread together, right? Because especially if you expand the school day, right, and ex you expand the school year, the school systems start to control a lot of food access for children. Yes. Yes. And I would say, as someone who is in an urban school district with many of the schools that are old buildings, they actually weren't built with kitchen facilities, okay? So these were schools that were built when kids went home for lunch and then came back. So what I saw as a parent would be that kids who got lunch in schools, it was all prefabricated, it was in plastic, it was microwaved, it was not good quality. It wasn't homemade, like it was not really good food, right? It, right. it was barely passable as food. But you can, and, and a lot of this is commodities, the Walmarts, if you get after school programs, they start throwing off the stuff that's like not that great and like just give it to the poor kids at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you expand that. But um, so a friend who is a second grade teacher in Maine, she said her co-teacher, and this was maybe four years ago, and she, she had a blog called Saving Maine Schools. Um, her co-teacher brought in a program with Fitbits for the kids, and it was tied to UNICEF, and it was wearables for good, okay? And this was like a UNICEF program. And the kids were supposed to show a certain amount of step counts or fitness, and then if they did, then a food packet would be sent to a child in need somewhere in the global south. And these wearables actually, they, with UNICEF, started to be branded by George Lucas and Star Wars and Target. And so there are these systems when we talk about the internet of bodies, like that is the internet of bodies, right? So you're actually double dipping because you get an impact metric for the kids' health outcomes in Maine, and then you have like a hunger impact on you know the humanitarian aid um, in Africa, and you're you're double dipping on the impact data, right? And so you know, and what she said is like you know this is a, a seven year old comes up and and they were like, but but if they have the food, why don't they just give it to the kids? Wow. Like, why don't they? And like, yes, the wisdom of the seven year old. If yes. they have the food from the mountain of babes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's what we're up against. And everyone thinks that they're doing right. Right. That they're doing right. And, and many of these systems are coming out of the aid space, but they're boomeranging back into domestic poor populations. Mm -hmm. And um, and I will say a lot of it. So goal two is hunger. Goal three is health, the health impacts, and they interface. And Michael Bloomberg is connected to a lot of this. He was the one who was putting the calorie counts, right? Because he was the UN ambassador for climate change and the World Health Organization. He was running the New York City police state rollout with Microsoft. You know, it is totally the nanny state, right? It is your government run by Google and Goldman Sachs. And no one quite understood where it was going when they just wanted to put the calorie counts. But this is where it goes. It goes to the DNA nudge band at this at this next phase, um, you know, and, and then to, down to your biosensors. But um, they want to do something called social prescribing, social prescribing. And I will say there are things that sound nice um, if you don't know the seamy underbelly of it. So they will say things like, let me write you a prescription for nature. Mm -hmm. It does not sound nice. It's a non-pharmaceutical intervention. It's so nice. We'll go on a hike. Why don't you go on a hike? Why don't you go volunteer, right? And there's a whole program in D.C., and, and I made a map of this called Produce Rx. Oh, let me write you a prescription for some kale, right? And so that's the way in which things that seem like, yeah, totally. Like if you were to go like have a chance to do yoga in the park or kayak or, you know, learn some new, you know, Ayurvedic cooking or something, and it wasn't on the blockchain, it wasn't in the, cool, good for you, right? Good for you. You know, I'm in a botanic garden. I said, it will be very different if they put a QR code on our sign and somehow we become an affiliate of a, a managed health system. Yep. And, and then they start saying, well, you know, if you if you really want to get your diabetic socks, for, you know, a refresh on that after six months, you better show that you showed up to the, to, you fulfilled your prescription for nature, mm -hmm. right? You better show that you ate all the right things. And so like disentangling both like policing people's health choices and health behaviors with providing access and support, 
It's very different things. It's very Whoa. different things. And well, we don't like hard. to call it policing. We're, we're, it's, it's incentivizing, right? We're just we're trying nudge. to help people. It's nudge. Nudge. You know, it's just a gentle nudge, and that's all that Chicago stuff. You know, choice architecture. So yeah, I hope people got that. If if you uh, didn't eat th on three days out of every week, if you didn't have one of our approved meals, if you didn't visit one of your four approved, you know, music or garden, one of well maybe you have some choice, but it's from this prescribed list from your insurance company. Um, then yeah, then you don't you don't get your benefits, and that's the same for all social programs. This is their. Uh, this that's is, what Medicare the, for all is. That's what it is. Yeah. And I keep saying like, why are people in the health space who are making this advocacy? not talking about blockchain electronic health records because that came straight out of Zeke Emanuel, right? Like that's that's the guy who's like, well, I think maybe after 72, you know, your time is up, right? right. That's the guy who's like the, the ACA architect, um, you know, whose brother, you know, is Rom and Ari is doing the entertainment and they've got a lock on all of this. This is the commodity center, this guy's, I mean, he's out of pen, right? He's a bioethicist, but like, we think maybe your time is gonna be up at some point. We'll just pull the plug on you. So. These electronic health records that are sold as a convenience, your SNAP is going to be feeding into your electronic health record. Your step counts are going to be feeding into your electronic health record. You know, early in all of this, there was a um, an article, an op-ed in Australia called Walk for the Dole. We well, you know everybody's sitting around in their house getting a little pudgy. You know, if you want your food stamps, you better demonstrate that you're walking. And, you know, and then Boris Johnson's like, yeah, I'm getting a little pudgy. Maybe I should do some walking, too. And, and that's how these things get woven in. And so... Like all of the people who are advocating for single payer health care are not connecting evidence or they call it value based payments, the Internet of Bodies, which just look up. Rand has a report called the Internet of Bodies Risks and Opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the guy who 100 percent funded this report, this white paper, he was the former chair of Swiss reinsurance. These are the derivatives people. These are these are the actuaries who are running this game who are betting for you or against you, you know? And um, so, and we are the supply chain. I mean, I know we, we had talked a bit about that, these global supply chains, right? But most people are not connecting that now our behavioral compliance is a key part of the supply chain. We are being processed. We mm -hmm. are like the chickens being deboned, de you know, on the assembly line. Um, only the deboning is, are you behaving according to these goals that, that, that global finance has set? Not, and, and any one of these goals, if it wasn't in the panopticon, if it wasn't tracked, if it was your choice, might not be a bad thing. I like riding a bike. I like eating kale. I like these things, right? Yes, it's yes. It's very different if it's like Goldman Sachs is betting on how, if I went up the hill on my bike ride home or not. Yes. It's very different. And, 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 the, and you're naming some of these players. It's the same. You know, you look at the World Economic Forum's tracks for control of water, and it's Nestle, Unilever, Pepsi. You have the company. These, these are the companies who are deboning it, as you put it, a humanity, the different parts of your behavioral profiles, and then make, play, placing bets on that, trying to uh, find financial incentives. It's just insane. That was, it was a great uh, way of explaining that. I'm still trying to figure out what um, social justice has to do with my gut biome. And uh, so you mentioned, actually, was it a social injection? One thing that I have seen was that the, this new, it's not a pandemic, it's a syndemic. It's this synthesis of social conditions and behaviors and things that we need to solve. And we need a social vaccine, which is a combination of equitable outcomes. And, you know, it's just it's an astounding use of language, perversion, really, of language. Uh, is that the same sort of social injection that you were referencing? Well, there's a couple things. What I have seen a lot is called social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and and again, if you if you peel back the history on public health, as I'm you know I'm I'm sure you do to the Rockefellers, like it's not the nice thing that you think it is. Like I think most most of us, if, until you look into the history of it, think oh, public health is for the public good because we care about people being healthy, and that isn't actually what it, it's ever been about. Mm -hmm. um, so the social determinants of health is looking at the ways in which um, you know, people's environments, uh, the, the circumstances in which they live, uh, the behavior of the people around them impact their health outcome, right? But the reality is, is that they're not, they are, have no interest in fixing the environmental, the, their goal is through the behaviorism is to put the responsibility on the individual to behave properly as though there was not a structure to the problems in which they exist. So um, 
the garden where I'm at is in the middle of um, historically it's opposite refineries. Okay, like Pennsylvania, Philadelphia was one of the first refineries because oil was in Titusville. Um, it's a center of trash transfers. Um, we have one of the up, up, up river, one of the oldest trash compaction oil like things from the 20s. It's like a historic monument to trash compaction. You know, we have the, the, the world, the, the recycling centers that are like waste management and the mob, you know. And so it's like this very high and, and, and giant electrical towers running through. Right. And so these people, this part of the city that we're in, the giant scrapyards, right, trap the, you know, it, it's, it's so sad because the parking lot. Um, it used to be for Yellowbird school buses, like for the city school buses. And now we, there are no more school buses. And so it's just a scrapyard with torn apart cars. And there's houses opposite that. There's little row houses, modest row homes. People are living in this environment that's making them sick. And yet no one is gonna come in and say, here, you know what, let me get rid of this scrapyard and put in like a nice park and some, give you guys community gardens. And, and no, they're gonna say, here's your head, here's your brainwave monitor. Like here's your step count thing. Here's your DNA nudge band. Like you better perform, um, even though now we're installing all these five you know, G small cells that the frequency is gonna like, very likely lead to increased diabetics. You know, if you look at electric electronics, um, you know, we're going to slap you electronics on you that might make you pre-diabetic, but then we're going to test that you've behaved according to our rules. And so that's the thing that is so frustrating is that if you actually believe that Goldman Sachs cared, <laughs> you know, that it wasn't just a money laundering thing through children. I mean, in the deal that they did on Salt Lake City, this pre-K social impact bond, they gave pre-K to 100 kids that were screened into the program and the cost offset was special education at kindergarten, okay? So they gave them a year or two of pre-K. Of the 100 kids, only one of them got special education. And they said, that's outrageous because that, that, that would never work. Like that, those numbers don't add up. So either you're screening kids in that didn't, wouldn't have needed it or right. you're depriving kids of services or both, right? Yeah. Or both. And so they control the game. And, yeah. you know, and I, I've done, you know, some talks like, it's their game. We're in this game. Kevin Werbach of Wharton, who is a gamification and a blockchain expert, says, you know, you want to be the one designing the game. Because half the people don't even know they're in the game. Yes. And like another 30 percent of the people don't really know the rules of the game or they don't know all the rules of the game. There's only a small number of people who actually know that there's a game or what the rules are. Mm -hmm. So you're, mm -hmm. you want to be the game designer. And that's what the that's what the Michael Bloomberg, the data analysts, the, the the people who are being groomed for this prison planet, running this prison planet, are doing. And, you know, I'm the parent of a college age student who you don't want your kid to win or get the brass ring and, and be and get to be the overlord. I mean, I don't I don't like because that's a soul killing thing. Mm -hmm. Like who's going to get to write the plays and actually farm the land and, you know, take care of people if the robots are doing it all? Nobody. So we have to fight for our right to do that and and um, and be in relationship both to one another and to the land and to the ecosystems. Because what I always say is I'm also fighting for the bees like these stupid robo bee people at, you know, uh, Harvard, the Wist, whatever institute. They're going to kill all the pollinators. You know, I actually talked to somebody in the wellness space about five and six G. I'm like, how can you be wellness and be all about the five G and the blockchain? And they're like, well, like maybe I will have clothes we can wear outside. It'll be fine. I'm like, what about the bees? You know, then we're going to have to eat microgreens out of, you know, cargo containers. Well, we'll, we'll have some nanobots for fertilization services, as they call it, right? I know. So. Yeah. Uh, OK, so you're exactly right. I just want to explain a little bit more because I've talked in the past about how this design the game, the gamification thing, it means they make the rules, it means physical reality and, and like life as we've known it no longer is is the case. It's just whatever rules the technocrats impose upon us. And the way you describe that as flawless, they they are viewing these problems that mostly that they have created through this yeah. very narrow lens that allows them to put arbitrary parameters on it and then define weird goals that only drive your behavior, that only drive your compliance. It has nothing to do with making you better. It has nothing to do with even physical reality. It's just, you know, I've, I've used, because I talk about food, I've used the example of the folks, there's a University of Sheffield study that says sheep farmers could make more money if they stopped farming sheep, right? If they just stopped <laughs> doing that, and we'll pay them carbon offsets, and they'd actually make more profit. It makes no economic sense. There's nothing being produced, but money's being, you know, given here. But that's 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 an example of the way that when a technocratic 
government. Like the, when, when the state can come in and just impose arbitrary rules and incentives and change the structure of things, then they can drive behavior in, in, in weird ways that don't make uh, fundamentally that don't make real sense. What else, Allison, should I have asked today? What else would, would be a good question here? I mean, I think we covered a lot of ground. I mean, I think we need to look out for the children, you know, mm-hmm. and, and we need to, I mean, more and more people are going to be pushed on the government dependency. You know, that's, that's where it's going. So I think really understanding the ways in which many of those systems have been stacked against people for a long time. And I would also say that because of this stuff that's going on with blockchain now, these human capital bonds, the pay for success pro- projects, it's technically, you still need some government money, right? The government pays if it's de- deemed to work, like if a if a chronic illness program works or a recidivism program works or pre, but that can't last very long, right? Because essentially the rich don't pay taxes. And if the poor are all pushed onto UBI, there's really no government funding at that point, right? And so what, the the financiers have come up with, I believe, and, and again, it's 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 unclear if they will be able to do all of the things that they're saying, all these thought ideas. But they have pilots. There's something called an impact security. So that it's a company called NPX, uh, N is in Nancy, P is in Paul, X is in Xylophone. NPX Impact Security. One of the people's out of Wharton. So we just bake up all of this stuff in, in Philadelphia. And what they said was, it's essentially. Um, a new finance, debt finance vehicle where there's no government involved, okay? So nonprofits um, can issue debt and investors can invest in it and there's an out, a pay for performance component. And then if they hit their target, um, a foundation pays it back. And so we, if we understand that most of this is being run by FinTech, right, the concept, and pharma, mm-hmm. that and they have both sides, right? You've got Gates and the Gates Foundation. You have Dell and the Dell Foundation. You have the Hewlett Packard, the you know William Floyd Hewlett Packard Foundation. You've got they own both sides. So the people who are trapped in the middle, giving the data to show that they've complied with the program to get the impact data, are just batteries for the system of money laundering um, and bet making. And so I think that's really important. Um, the other thing that I would say so. The piece of this is blockchain. So there's no government at that point, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even though the government is really corrupted, like, at least there's some sense maybe out there that you could still maybe change things. This is trapping people in a fully unaccountable system. Yes. That is where the libertarian stuff goes. And this is where I'm trying to, like, get tap into people who are more libertarian, like, constitutional minded, is that this augmented reality thing that that, that is being rolled out that is fundamentally, fundamentally a milita- militarized structure um, is what it runs blockchain. It's called the spatial web. That is the prison planet, right? And so that prison planet structure, that augmented reality structure is meant so that people, individuals, high wealth individuals can invest in whatever they want across the world, right? Mm -hmm. They can invest in wells. They can invest in farms. They can invest in toddlers. They can invest in people in addiction. They can invest in, you know, overweight people, they can just put their money and it's only accountable to the contract, right? It's only accountable to whatever contract that is made. And the people who are being managed under that the terms of that contract may not have a choice. They may be pushed into those services because they have no other choice. They have no other economic options other than to be managed um, for workforce development, training, food, whatever. Like, they're going to be pushed into that. So even if this idea of like the bad government, which I agree with, it doesn't necessarily resolve on blockchain if you like create global investment markets in poverty. And then it's just a free for all with Peter Thiel and Piero Mediar and, you know, these folks in the Vatican investing you. And and many of them, I believe, will be faith based institutions, all kinds. And then what happens if you got trapped in a service provider that is running behavioral compliance on blockchain tied to a certain faith practice that isn't yours. And so I guess that's the other piece of this that I, I want to balance because I'm trying to like there there was I, I tweeted today like there's a like a white paper from an Idaho libertarian leaning group that was saying like, hey, get the government out of our business. Like, look, our churches can invest in our people. Mm-hmm. And I've been going to like, you know, I talk to people in Israel. I talk to people in Salt Lake City. And I'm like, listen, if you're a person of faith, like you have to really 
get a handle on what this is, that this is surveillance play tables and, and DNA nudge bands? And is that actually a charitable enterprise? Because my gut is still that most people are good. The institutions may be totally corrupted, but I believe that most people are good if they knew, if they mm -hmm. had the information, that they would make a better choice. Yes. And so yes. this is the piece that I'm trying to sort of spin out. And then within that, the other thing I will say is um, the impact investors are after cooperatives or after worker cooperatives too. And that has deep connections to agricultural spaces because one of the uh, impacts will be uh, worker productivity or happiness or something like that. And they'll say, look, workers who are part of cooperatives are much better. Like they feel much better about their work. So these impact investors have been making their way in very specific ways into the cooperative movement. And yeah. so again, you probably know more about that than me, but I can see in the agricultural spaces that that is going to be important to know. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff around uh, farm worker protections and, and just creating a new class of people there that needs protection. Um, one other thing I was hoping you could speak to actually, because we mentioned the like the, the companies that don't have people that, that are that don't have management. And I think that's similar to the state that isn't a government anymore. It's just yeah. now we have this, you know, we got to be careful because we're years away. We're walking now into this to the future where there there aren't people to appeal to. There's just these algorithms that run and they have AIs talking to each other and this singularity and that. Um, but the idea of the gig economy and waking up and you just check your your AI to figure out what you who you know which which Dow boss you report to that day. <laughs> yeah, Can you I know. Out a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, so I mean that's part of the education piece is that um, I think many people in the blockchain space are imagining it mostly as like um, uh, uh, you know crypto is 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 financial assets, right? But it's a ledger system to track everything, really. Yep, it's tokens. Exactly. Rights and privileges, and this is what I need like the constitutionalist people to understand, is like you're never getting down to the Constitution. The tokens that are in your wallet for your behavioral compliance are going to decide what you get to do and not get to do. And you don't, those human rights, those constitutional rights, you're not getting there because the militarized augmented reality is going to be that buffer to get to keep you away from that unless we do otherwise, right? Unless they wake up and, and do otherwise. So in the education space, and this is where I actually thought the digital identity, so the um, these medical passporting systems, which I kind of call like, you know, biometric geofencing, right? Because it really is like the prison planet run from space and borders are going to change. And the idea mm -hmm. of immigration issues is going to really morph and people are not up to speed on that. But like, mm -hmm. the, you know, your biometric data can create a real time border around you anywhere you want. So that they're get, getting rid of national borders, you know, and replacing them with real time geofencing. Um, and I'm not a nationalist, and I, I think that we need global solidarity because, like, in this world of competing for AI gig work, we don't want something where the kids, you know, in Ohio are competing against the kids in Boa Vista, Brazil, or competing against, you know, the kids in Foshan, China, to do low-wage piece rate work um, for a day or two and then move on to the next thing. Like. We should want a world where all the kids actually get a decent quality of life. And so mm -hmm. we're not each other's enemies. The enemies are the people who are running the prison planet. And like, yeah. I, I just want to make that clear. So I had thought that um, the AI is going to assign work um, and whether this is a decentralized autonomous organization like a DAO, like a company written in code um, on a leaderboard, which is already in place in a lot of the coding world, people who are doing, um, you know, remote work you know, you log in and, and then, I mean, even the M Turk work, you know, the Amazon, you know, work, coding work, that's been going on for a really long time, like mm -hmm. in certain segments, but most people, if you're not doing it, you don't even know that that economy exists. So, you know, you, you, it's not even that you log in. I sort of imagined it as QR codes are just not like health codes, right? You imagine like all the health codes, but now it's work codes. It, you need to have these 200 codes to apply for this work, right? And then, and your your whole life is you're chasing the next skill code to try to get the work, but there's always like 200 people competing for the work. So you go into debt to do this stupid online class to get the badge to show that you can compete for the work and then they'll say, oh no, now you need this badge, right? You need this badge and it all goes on to blockchain. It's in your online learning locker. So I had thought when all of this stuff came before last March that it was going that blockchain digital identity, which sometimes they call self-sovereign identity and that's the ID 2020, would come through in, in the United States at least through the education credential space. 
So mm-hmm. MIT had something called Learning Machine, and they were doing digital transcripts. And they were, look how convenient it is. You have your college transcript on your phone, which is ridiculous because, like, you don't need your college transcript on your phone unless you're moving into this new phase of globalized gig labor. Yeah. But that was being sold through Southern New Hampshire University, and then it was having pilots in Dallas, which is green light credentials, and um, and uh, Learning Machine was in Tulsa. So these same this. And, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase was backing it. It was community college. Look, in high school, you can get an associate's degree when you're 17 and, and be all done with school. And then you can just track your, your micro credentials. These are all going on blockchain and it's all for the, the identification. But what they most want, they want your behavioral data because it's all about trust. And that's the code word for blockchain is trust. How is the AI going to know they can trust you? to do the work if they don't also have your behavioral data on record, right? And that is exactly what, if you listen to the the clip I pulled uh, from Hoskinson about Cardano in Ethiopia, is they've said, hey, like our new education program on blockchain is totally aligned to the government interests and your metadata from the time you're like a young child will be tracked and um, we will know if you're a good actor in the space and we will be able to tell who is qualified, who is who is almost like morally allowed to have a job. Mm-hmm. And he just says it in a two minute clip. Like I didn't even have to, he just says straight up, this is the plan. Blockchain metadata will decide this, so, you know, and it's not just in China, right? This is Ethiopia now. And, it, and Hoskinson is based out Colorado. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's Colorado, Hong Kong, Edinburgh, this stuff is spread everywhere. It's globalization. Um, yep. And it's called Globalization 4.0. And I encourage people to look into it because it's, It's not just screen based now, it's haptic robotics. It's like, here, put on your haptic suit and your augmented reality headset and run, and you're gonna be doing factory operations. Like maybe you're gonna be doing chicken processing, but the chicken processing plant is, you know, five countries over. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, and people can't even imagine that that's something that's coming, but it is coming. And, um, you know, I don't know where all the anti-globalization folks are. I mean, to me, that is the central premise. and not coming from a, um, a nationalist, like I don't like other countries, but that we actually need to respect our local systems, right? Our local foodways, our local, um, you know, that's real sustainability, right? Is to, to be situated in a space and have a sustainable quality of life using the resources that are in a relatively proximate place to you, which may involve relearning how we eat, right? but not in a way that's a 3D printer, DuPont's giving you your bio nutraceutical, but actually what grows where you are and like, let's stop the geoengineering already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's better than showing up to the uh, global mechanical Turk in exchange for your soylent green for the day. Uh, That's a really staggering conversation and I've (laughs) genuinely enjoyed walking through the technocratic landscape with you. I think we've thrown out a lot of the, the terms and ideas that might be new for a lot of people so that they can go and um, look more into them, watch more of your stuff, and just actually go see. Please, by all means, don't take our word for it. Go look at the any of the names we've talked about today. These are public policy documents. They do shroud it in these weird philanthropic-sounding uh, terms, but you know these are uh, words that we need to have so that we can normalize them and, and make sure other people are aware of these agendas going on. Uh, there's one more question that I ask all my guests, but I think particularly in light of just how dark some of the some of this future kind of seems like it will be, I wanted to ask you, and that is, you know, if you stare too long into the abyss, you risk becoming the abyss. So what do you do to, to uh, for self-care? How do you unplug from this? What do you, how do you take care of yourself? Um... Well, like I said, this Dandelion Project has been pretty amazing. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, and again, like I'm trying to, uh, one of the things we read at the at the Wall Street Bowl, and actually it's really interesting because I don't know if you remember a while, a number of years ago, there was this fearless girl statue and they put the girl statue in front of the Wall Street Bowl and they're like, oh, look, it's women's rights, which is really another sustainable development goal five, which is gender equity. And it was put there by a global investment firm, state studio, you know, but we were deconstructing the, the, um, the bull actually had a friend um, do a strategic application of some dandelion tincture on the working end of that bull, which was, was pretty interesting. But, um, you know, it, we had some levity around it and we were talking about, um, we didn't want to stand in line to wait for the head end of the bull, so we just worked on the, the what was available. <laughs> <laughs> that was being very capitalist to wait in line to put our garland, our medicinal garland around the head of the bull. So we just, we cobbled its foot. But we are reading out of A Wrinkle in Time, um, mm-hmm which is a book like from the seventies I read as a, as a kid in, in elementary school. And it was sort of like, 
like love wins in the end it's this loving thing and so i think right now um we went to go make this garland in in um a city college i have a friend and she's like i know where there's a ton of dandelions on the campus of city college which is really important because all these crazy equations were uh, put together in the harlem children's zone right so i'm like i'm gonna we're gonna get these plants from from and we went up and all of the dandelions had gone to seed and blown away so it was all these stems that were like this big i'm like oh well that's well now what do we do so we put mugwort and we had planting and we had star of bethlehem and we like wove this thing together and they were all medicinals and and it was this creative act right and it was like also serendipity because like we kind of had a plan but we did it with people and these are people I did not know before. And, and you know, and I've had people like I, I put my address. I have if you look up Dandelion Manifesto on Wrenching the Gears, you can mail me Dandelions. Right. And someone's like, well, you shouldn't put your address on there. It's very dangerous. I'm like, you know, like they can find me if they want. But, you know, I've gotten so many like somebody sent me this beautiful necklace like and somebody sent me um, Dandelion Honey from Georgia. And people have sent me things like and people want to have this connection. Right. Mm -hmm. And so. I feel like even in the resistance movement right now, there's a lot of bitterness, right? Like people have hit this plateau of being really angry and out of control. And I'm like, you know, this is, it's a psychic, like it's a spiritual thing. And like, we have to work really hard to find the loving parts, right? Like if you risk and you put stuff out and that the other people who are willing to risk also put themselves out. And then you find these amazing things. Like I have learned way more in the past year plus months, I would have a way more, like if I, this is not the midlife crisis I expected, but like, I actually, it's like a gift. Like people have given me these gifts. And, you know, I talk about like the gift economy. It's the not blockchain economy, right? You put things out in the world, you use your gifts. Like my gifts are making these stupid maps and talking on interviews or whatever. And then people give you their gifts. Mm -hmm. And and it, nobody's tracking it. Nobody's counting, tabulating. It's just, it's be there's beauty in it like there's this beauty and um you know we were actually standing at the base of the washington statue in front of uh, Fe uh federal hall which is where he signed that was inaugurated in the northwest passage and whatever and and um someone had gifted me this beautiful box of shells and dandelions from lake onondaga upstate and i've sprinkled the shells on washington shoe and i said you know we shouldn't have done that you land speculator you know next to the front <laughs> building i'm like no, like, you know, and then we're scrubbing the base of the statue and this guy walks up and he has a gorilla mask on. And I'm like, oh, New York, this is really New York. Like, it's like these steps in this, this plinth with the statue and this gorilla mask and he's watching us and we're like, we refuse the human capital bond market. We refuse putting children on blockchain and we, you know, refuse the new world order. And, and the guy with the gorilla mask is watching us and I kind of put out on Twitter, I was like, this is like, go figure, right? Like, what is this thing? And someone said, that's Hanuman or whatever, which is like, this monkey god who like protects the people who tell the truth. And I'm like, okay, so maybe this guy just showed up with some other thing, but I'm going with it. There's somebody out there protecting people who tell the truth. And that's nice. you and that's me. And we do the best we can, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have and the one. Agent. Yes. The one thing the AI, I'm sure that drives the, the AI crazy because um, as long as we come from here, they might be able to model us and, and predict us. But when we come and we shift, to the heart, like you said, yeah. move to that loving space that is not their domain. That is where we still own it. The digital space, it's all theirs. Physical yeah. reality, they are intruding into, but this, they, yeah. this is ours, and uh, and that's where we need to shift back to. Allison, again, thank you so much. Wrenchinthegears.com. How can people support you and help you and find you? Um, yeah, well, I would just say, like, check out my blog. I still have a YouTube channel, just my name, Allison McDowell. I'm on Twitter, Philly AFI2. And um, yeah, look me up, send me some dandelions. Uh, we're we're going to hit up Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Common Pass Project. We're thinking about a solstice celebration actually out on Roosevelt Island, which is where a bunch of the folks from Common Pass are from. So we're thinking about a celebration of natural life if you're in the greater New York area, June 20th. We're still putting it, put it together. Follow me on Twitter. We'll figure it out. But um, yeah, like, Let's do it for each other, right? And and not just humans, also the other little critters, you know, the bees and the moss and all of the, because that is the, the natural connection. That is the not planetary computer part. Beautiful. Allison McDowell, thank you so much. All right, thanks.